who here got into design because they wanted to change the world? Go ahead, raise your hands. Yeah, me too, me too. And everyone that didn't raise their hands, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and design is no doubt impactful. It's absolutely changing the world, and it's profitable too. McKinsey just report, um, published this report three weeks ago saying that companies that prioritize design outperform in revenue everyone else by two times. That's a lot of money. Um, but I've been wondering, whose world are we changing with the work that we do here in Silicon Valley? And this question came to me when I was leading a vision sprint for a new product offering. And the target market was being described as young, married, upper middle class people that were moving into regentrifying neighborhoods. And the workshop kept going and they were talking about, okay, what else about the market? Do they like the color yellow? Do they have two kids or maybe 1.5 kids? Um, but I was stuck. I was like, all right, I, I really need to know. Um, what does re-gentrifying mean? And the answer that I got was restoring a neighborhood like West Oakland to its former grandeur. And this kind of crushed me. Um, I lived in West Oakland for a really long time, and it's where I found myself. It's where I became who you see now. And it's still a really big, important part of my identity. And then I looked around the room, and it dawned on me that the product that we were working on wasn't for people that looked like me. And then I thought about it a little bit more, and I realized that every product that I've ever worked on was not for people that look like me. And the reason for that, digging in very deep, is that the design process itself isn't for people that look like me. A lot of what we're doing is designing for exclusion, which is interesting because we're here. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about how the design process excludes and how it does it in three ways. So first, who we design for, how we work, and who we idolize. So is everyone familiar with this? You say it a lot at work. <laughs> me too. Um, so I took the mantra, you are not the user, to heart. And so it wasn't really like obvious to me that you know, design is exclusive. I was just doing my job. Of course, I don't look like these people. I'm, I'm not the user. Um, but with my new perspective, I had to ask, OK, who, who is the user? And how do they get chosen? And because design is part of business, um, business often needs to target a market so that they can, you know, make money. And they use demographics. So demographics are descriptors um, like income, gender, age, race, um, religion, and they're intended to quantify the human experience. But demographics are dangerous because they leverage and perpetuate stereotypes. And the way that they do this is through the kind of elephant-colored thing in the room here, bias, um, which is you know people apply their bias when they are trying to think through, OK, a upper middle class family, what does that look like? What, what are their needs? Um, and a lot of that bias is informed by media, media portrayals and lack of representation. So when it comes to people that look like me, there's only two varieties of positive. There is being really, 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 really good at sports and being really, 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 really good at entertainment. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'm qualified for this job. <laughs> and these jobs are generally unobtainable. And for people that look like me, very rarely are we portrayed in occupational roles. And then as for the negative portrayals, I don't actually really want to get into it because it bumps me out. So what can we infer about this woman's needs, about her um, 
yeah, what, what does she need when we're trying to design for her? What can her age tell us? What can her uh, ethnicity tell us? What can where she lived tell us so that we can design the right product? The answer is nothing because demographics don't make good design decisions. So instead, design for behavior. And to get you started, here's a few ways to remove bias from your design process and do the right thing and design for the people that actually have wants and needs and behaviors. So behavior segmentation, reason patterns, and jobs to be done. So when you expand and look beyond target demographics and you design for behavior, you get to this really awesome classic inclusive design example of the OXO good groups. Does everyone know this story? No, no? okay, great. Um, I was gonna spare you, but you're not getting spared. Okay, <laughs> um, so the one on the right here is how we used to peel our carrots. And you know, it, when you grab that, it hurts. And the founder of OXO saw that his wife was hurting her hand because she had developed arthritis. And he was like, how, how can I help? And because he took this approach of like, okay, we're going to focus on a need, we get this really pleasant, spongy, thinned vegetable peeler that I think is like the best vegetable peeler on the planet, actually. <laughs> so now you see that demographics are exclusionary, they're biased, and in some cases, they're dangerous. So next, I would ask you to consider how techno-optimism is dangerous. So who here creates or writes scenarios or creates storyboards? Go ahead, raise your hands. Me too, me too. Um, and then for those who need a refresher, um, so with storyboards, we have, <laughs> with scenarios, we have a user. And with our technology, we're going to improve their life and they become a better version of themselves, <laughs> right? So we're gonna work through an example of this together. So here is an example of a scenario, and this, was, this came from value-sensitive design, so I have to give credit because it's awesome. Um, and it reads, Sarah and her daughter, Leah, recently moved to a new city. Sarah works full-time and worries about Leah walking home after school. Sarah uses an app to map the safest route and knows she'll get an alert if Leah gets too close to a dangerous area. So with that type of scenario, we might design something that looks like this. Um, this is Safety Net, and it uses demographics and criminal data and GPS to create maps of neighborhoods. And it alerts people of unpleasant and dangerous areas during their travels. So we're walking and approaching a red zone, and then we get an alert, and it says North Meadow is dangerous. So in Silicon Valley, we would look at this, and we'd say, great, we've done it, ship it. <laughs> it totally like, meets the criteria outlined in the scenario that we wrote. This is great. Leah's gonna be good, and uh, Sarah can sleep better. We're changing the world. But we should be more responsible and ask questions about the work that we do. So we should ask who else might be impacted? And then are there long-term consequences to what we loose upon the world? And then what could go wrong? So if we go back to this, who else might be affected by our work here? We might write a, a different type of scenario, like this one about Evan. So Evan has never used safety net, but his mom says it keeps strangers out of the neighborhood. His dad complains that it keeps her home's value down and makes it so only poor people can move in. And then if we go back and think about are there longer term consequences or what could possibly go wrong? So over the long term, perhaps people use this to buy houses and the city continues to self-segregate. And you have people living in pocketed just groups of people. And then how this could possibly go wrong is maybe Safety net is used to draw districting lines for elections. So instead, let's design for techno-skepticism. 
not the optimism. And ways to do that, value-sensitive design, which is so good. You guys need to look it up right away. And then the tarot cards of tech, which are beautiful. So we've already talked about who we design for and how that can be exclusionary. But where we work can also be exclusionary. So in the office, we hire like-minded, like-looking people. And then we get to numbers that look like this. I know the resolution's rough, but it's beautiful on my computer. <laughs> um, so to give you a more legible view, um, we have Asian at 10.4%. These numbers are current, by the way. 10.4% bi or multiracial people, 11%. Black, African American, 3.4%. Latinx, 8.1%. Native American and First Nations, 1%. Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, 0.8%. White Caucasian, 60.4%. Prefer not to say 2.4 and other 2.4. Sorry, I promise not to read you numbers like that ever again. So once you get into the door, it's so easy for your voice to be ignored. You might be the only person on your team. And if you're in a conversation, it only takes two more voices to cancel out one. And then who makes the decisions at the companies that we work at? Someone that makes the most money, highest paid person's opinion, for those who don't know who Hibbo is. <laughs> um, they ultimately have the, the say. So a diverse team can be overruled in an instant. And you know, as designers, we all have this role where we are advocating for our users on behalf, or I'm sorry, I'm saying this backwards. We're, we advocate for our users to our engineering and product partners. That's, that's our job, that's what we do. But then there's a second job, which is the representative. So if you are anything other than the monoculture, your other job is an, an immense amount of emotional labor where you are representing whatever, maybe your race is, your gender, your non-gender, et cetera. And you have to do it really, really well, and you have to roll with the punches so that the door stays open for anyone else that looks like you later. Rough. So now we've looked at you know, how, who we design for and how we work, and the last place is actually the first place where we learn how to be designers. And it starts with who we idolize. So, sorry, the smoke is really getting to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the first designers, architects, industrial designers, were men that look like this. And because they had access, they were able to you know, have the first clients, and then they could teach about their craft, they could start schools, write the books, and their work today is still celebrated. And with experience design, we have a similar history. And just imagine how much better design would be if our education included more diverse voices. There's so much missing in our design education today. So nearing the end here, design Education obviously isn't going to change overnight. The design process won't change overnight. But we're all here and we're, we've kind of self-selected that we care for this topic. So I ask you to reconsider your design process and like be kind to yourself because the stuff is hard. And then remember, to change the world, you have to actually include it. Oh, sorry, you wanted a picture. <laughs> and um, while well, we're here. So when you're talking to your, your product partners, your engineering partners, you know, you are one voice, but that doesn't mean that your voice doesn't, can't be backed by more voices that you bring in. That's one way to do it. All right, thanks, y'all.